Welcome to Grace Family Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us today and can't wait to worship together. If you're new here today, our hosts would love to welcome you in the comments. So say hi and let us know where you're joining from. Your kids are going to love the new series at Grace Kids. Each week we post the message for the week and our Faith at Home video on our Grace website, app and YouTube channel. Over the next month, your pre-primary kids are going on an adventure in the big sandbox discovering that Jesus loves us and He invites all of us to join Him and be His forever friend. Your primary kids will be on a journey discovering what it means to be a super fan for others, learning how we can cheer others on and show God's kindness. If you need a reminder about anything I've just said, make sure you've downloaded our app and followed us on social media where we keep you updated each week. Welcome to our Grace Family Church online service today. It's so good to have you join us. If it's your first time, why don't you let us know in the comments so one of our online hosts can connect with you. And you've joined us on an exciting Sunday because today, for the first time in 2021, we're meeting at all five of our campuses. And it's also an exciting Sunday for another reason, hey Paul? Um, I think, I think potentially <laughs> what she's trying to get at there is that I, I think today is a thing called Valentine's Day. And I, maybe that's news to you. And if it is, and there's someone sitting next to you who you like, no, just quickly like make a plan and, and say happy Valentine's Day to them. Uh, but I just need your opinion. If you're watching online, uh, let me know in the comments. Um, when, when Pips and I started dating, she told me she didn't like flowers. And so I have kept her to her word over the last few years of our marriage, and I've never bought her flowers on Valentine's Day. Am I, am I making a good decision? Like, let me know in the comments, yes, keep going, Paul, or, 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 or no? No, no, oh. I just need to preface first yeah. that it was over 10 years ago, which means I was very young and didn't know. Yes. And also when we first got married, I don't even think we had a dining room table to put flowers on. So. Yeah. So just yeah. let me know, should I buy her flowers? Shouldn't I buy her flowers? Just, just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, if you have kids in your home with you today and are looking for parent tools and resources as you get them ready to go back to school, then why don't you go ahead and give us a thumbs up in the comments so our Grace Kids team can connect with you. Absolutely. Uh, later in the service, we are going to be sharing communion. And uh, if that is something that is new to you, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do is to prepare for that, is to get some juice, get some water, get something in your house that you can drink and share, and then get something that you can uh, break apart, a piece of bread, uh, a cracker, a biscuit, whatever you have in your home. I'm now gonna hand over to Katia and her team as they lead us in a time of singing to our God.
take communion together. And worship isn't just singing, it's not just music. There are many ways that we can worship God. And communion is one of them. Why? Because it's pausing. It's stopping to allow time to commune with God. What does communing with God mean? To stop and listen to remember. When we stop and remember who He is and what Jesus has done and we respond to Him, that is an act of worship. So wherever you are right now, if you've got something representing the juice and the bread, why don't you grab that and I'm gonna lead you through a scripture in Matthew. From Matthew 26, it says, 
As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and He blessed it. He broke it in pieces and He gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. Let's eat together. He took a cup of wine and He gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to each of them and said, each of you drink from this, for it is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and His people, poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Let's drink together. Jesus, today we pause and we remember and our hearts are filled with such gratitude toward You that You were willing to bleed and die so that we can know You. So in this space where we collectively together worship You, we remember
will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause I love you, Lord. You're your mercy. He never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will say Of the goodness of Thank you, team, for leading us so well during that time of worship. We're going to go into a time now where we participate in giving together. I know that many of you who watch online give online, uh, but if you give during the service, the details are below me. You can pause the screen right now if you need to get the Zapper code out. But as you prepare to give, uh, I want to just go back to this idea of a service that we've been in over the last while, uh, this idea of fighting hustle and ending hurry. And what I'm so aware of in my own life, and maybe this is true of you as well, is that the times where I feel like I'm having to hustle the most and hurry the most, the times in my life where I am most anxious and most worried, where there perhaps is even the most tension in our marriage, is when it comes to money, when it feels like money is too tight and there is too much month for our money. And then there is this invitation to give, to tithe, to, to bring to God what is His. How, how can that help us? We see the reality is the invitation of Jesus to you and to me is an invitation to a life of peace and a life of trust, that Jesus will always provide for our needs. And it is in moments like this that we make a bold declaration as we give to say, God, I'm not going to hustle. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to hurry because you are my provider and you are my source. And so as you give now, or maybe as you give later in this month, would you hold on to that? Fight the hustle. In the hurry in your heart and trust Him as you give. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you right now that you are the source of all that we need in our lives. I pray for people right now who are facing incredible obstacles. Father, that you would show them your goodness, that you are the one who provides, you are the one who opens the door, you are the one who makes a way. Thank you that this invitation to give is not a demand you place on us, but it's a gift you give to us, Jesus. A gift that says we can trust you and that you will do something in our hearts as we participate. Jesus, I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So we mentioned it earlier, and yes, we are meeting again in person at our physical campuses. So if you're feeling comfortable to be back at your church, then why don't you get in touch with your campus this week for all the details? Because each campus is doing things a little differently, and we'll be communicating this on social media in the weeks to come too. For our online campus, your service times will be a little bit different over the next while, uh, at half past seven and at quarter past nine, but Dill will keep you in the loop going forward. Absolutely. Well, today we start a new series called This Is Us. And over the next three weeks, we want to discover what we feel like God has called us to as a community, what He's inviting you into. Now, this isn't just about the service that you watch in this moment right now. This is about the church that we see. I see a church bursting with life, so much so that buildings cannot contain it and nations cannot ignore it. I see a church that the unchurched love to attend. A church who never stops searching for lost people because God never stopped searching for us. I see a church on the forepoint and in the loopgrave of the strijd between armoede and onrecht. I see a church where all people can come as they are and find a place to belong. I see a church I see a church full of people who are discovering the mystery of their union with God, each other, and their divine purpose here on this earth. I see a church where relationship trumps religion every time. 
I see a church so kingdom minded that we will count whatever the cost and pay whatever the price to see that kingdom come. But on the sacrifice of many. I see a church so compassionate that people are drawn from impossible situations into a loving and caring circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. I see a church doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly. I see a church that creates space for life for God to do what only He can do. I see a church that is not just grace in name, but grace in nature. Gibona ibanda elisangene no kunukun, okungum kum walo uwenza izwe in dao engon. I see a church that loves God, loves people, and is making a difference. I see a church whose head is Jesus, whose help is in the Holy Spirit, and whose focus is the Great Commission. During the 15 years of Jess and our marriage, there have been times when Jess has turned to me and asked me this question. Tom, do you love me? Do you love me? And and there's a part of me that wants to respond, of course I love you. I mean, I told you on our wedding day I loved you and I said if anything changes, I'd let you know. (laughs) But, but, But really, what is she actually asking in that question? You see, I don't think she's asking, am I committed to her? Am I faithful to her? She knows that. She's not asking, will I help with the kids tomorrow? She knows that too. She's not even really asking about a feeling. Do I feel in love with her? I mean, we're long past the in love stuff and both of us know that love is not a feeling that we chase, but a decision that we make every day. And the feelings tend to follow. So what is she asking? Well, in a sense, I think she's saying, do you like me? Do you want to be near me? Do you want to hear what I have to say? I know you have to listen to me because you're my husband and that's what good husbands are supposed to do. But do you actually want to hear me? Do you value my views, my opinion? Do you still believe that we're better together? Am I the one for you? Do you love me, Tom? Or am I just a roommate, another cog in the wheel of your busy life? We're starting a new series today called This Is Us. And really, that's exactly what it's about. It's about us, you and me, Grace Family Church, not the buildings, not the staff, us, the people who make up Grace, this community of faith. And it's about the kind of community, the kind of people that we want to be. For us, that's kind of summed up in three simple statements. Love God, love people, and make a difference. Love God, love people, and make a difference. A difference. Now, that's just not some kind of catchy vision statement that we put on our website. No, this is who we are. It's who we want to be. It's who we believe we've been called by God to be, a community of people that love Him, that love one another and those around us, and that are making a difference in this world. Now, not only is it who do we want to be, but it's also, I think, how we get there. It's how we grow in our faith. It's how we submit to the Lordship of Christ. It's how we overcome the obstacles in our lives. And it's how we bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. You see, if you're a follower of Christ, you you probably know what the greatest commandment is. It was written on stone on the tablets given to Moses, and it was repeated and expounded upon by Jesus in Mark chapter 12, when he was asked this question, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And this was his response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then he goes on. He says, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Now, the fact that Jesus adds this kind of second clause and actually says it's equally important, I think gives us a clue that loving God and loving people, they're kind of intricately connected. They can't really be separated. But we're going to get to the love people part next week in the series. But for today, we want to focus on this first part, love God. And what does that mean? Jesus says we should love God with all our hearts, minds, strength, and soul. 
And most of us have kind of heard that before or maybe know that. that that's the why and the what. But I think where many of us, certainly I fail or not really sure, is how? How do I actually love God? Or how do I show my love for God? You know, how do we love a God whom we cannot touch or see? I mean, I have a hard time enough showing my wife and my kids that I love them, clearly. But, and I can see them, I can touch them, I can interact with them in a very physical way. But God, how does that work? And especially when I don't feel like loving God or when it feels like the world is just kind of crumbling around me or my own world is crumbling. How do I love God then? when I've prayed and prayed and still no answer, when it feels like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, how do I love God then? When I've lost someone I loved, how do I love God then? I came across an interesting Facebook post by a friend of mine, Taryn Williams, um, and he was asking this really great question. Uh, and he was kind of aiming it specifically at people who used to attend church pre-COVID, but now have stopped for a number of reasons. And, and the question he asked was this, he says, would you say that your faith or that your relationship with God has one, increased, you know, gotten better, two, stayed the same, or three, gotten worse, deteriorated? And what was amazing to me reading through the comments was the very strong trend that emerged. Basically, most people who responded said that initially when COVID hit and they weren't able to attend church you know, in a regular fashion, or uh, that they actually said their faith increased, that they were in that number one category. But then over time, without regular gatherings or watching online or pursuing those regular spiritual disciplines, their faith began to dwindle. And most of the people on that Facebook post said that they were currently, if they were honest, sitting at that number three space, that their relationship with God had indeed deteriorated. Maybe that's true of you today. Maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe why you're watching this. Uh, to get back to where you were, perhaps. Or perhaps you need to share this with someone who you know is in that place right now. So how do we love God or get back to loving God in the midst of all that's going on in our world and in our lives? That is the question that we're looking at today. And in order to answer it, I want to read to you a story found in John's letter in chapter 21. And uh, I love the story. What's interesting about the story is that it's Jesus and, and, and who is God, who was manifest, you know, God manifest in physical form on earth. Jesus in the story asks the very same question that Jess has often asked me, do you love me? Do you love me? Let's read. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, yeah, there's my name, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too said the other disciples. Now, now, let me just pause there because this is kind of important detail. You see, after Jesus' death, uh, the disciples, they didn't really know what to do. They, so they kind of just went back to doing what they did know what to do. And for many of them, that was fishing. Fishing was their comfort zone, their security. It was also their livelihood. So they went back to it. Let's read on. They went out in the boat, but they caught nothing at all all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? And again, just to pause there, I love Jesus. You know, he's standing on the beach. Hey, fellows, if I think it was a South African, he would be, hey, how's it, Oaks? And it's not like he didn't know that they hadn't caught anything. He says, no, they replied. So then Jesus says, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. And so they did. And they couldn't haul in the nets because there were so many fish in it. Of course, this happened before with Jesus and the disciples. And so John, who's dictating this, this letter, he recognizes him. It says, then the disciple Je that Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water and headed to shore. Man, I love Peter. I mean, he's such an interesting character. Firstly, he's fishing naked, which is interesting. Um, secondly, he's just so impulsive. He's so impatient. He, he can't even wait to get to the shore. He just jumps right out the boat and swims to Jesus. You, you got to love that about Peter. He's, he's so desperate for Jesus. And it did make me think as I read this account, am I that desperate for Jesus? 
so desperate that I'd jump out of whatever boat I'm in and swim out to meet him. The account goes on. It says, the others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. Again, I just have to stop and admire the scene because, you know, I love this idea that one of the first thing God does, Jesus does, is not issue instructions to the disciples, you know, the commission them to their task. He, he does that, but that comes later. The first thing he does is cook them a meal. I mean, it's like a, like a beach bra. I mean, for me, it's this beautiful picture of God's desire to just be with us, to be in relationship with us, to hang out and to eat together. Bring some of the fish you just caught, says Jesus. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. Notice who's doing the serving, by the way. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter. Here comes the question. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, he's using his full name. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Do you love me more than these? Some theologians have argued that these is referring to the other disciples, like, Peter, do you love me more than those guys over there? But, but I don't think so. I think the text says that Jesus, you know, the text says Jesus asked Peter to drag the fish to shore. And then in order to count them, we knew there were 153. I think he would have had to lay them out on the beach. And I think when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? I think he's referring to the fish. Like, like hey, Peter, do you love me more than what you've known your whole life? Do you love me more than your job, your security, more than your livelihood? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. It's interesting that the word Jesus uses in the first two questions for love in the Greek is the word agape, which is kind of love as a choice. But then the third time he asked Peter, do you love me? The word here in this account is a different word for love. It's the word phileo, which is kind of a, it's a friendship love. It's a kinship love. And it speaks of an even deeper kind of longing of God to be close to us, to be with us, to walk alongside us as friends. Jesus goes on. He tells Peter, he says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Then follow me. Is this what it means to love God? And is it possible that what Jesus said to Peter could also be applied to us today? And then if so, what does it mean for us? What does it mean to feed my lambs or to take care of my sheep? We're going to get into all of that in, in a bit. But before we do, let me just quickly say what I think loving God doesn't mean. Because I think somewhere along the way between Jesus on the beach with Peter and where we are today as a, as a church, as a faith, I think we've got this thing mixed up. And perhaps we've made loving God more about rules, more about ticking certain boxes, more about morality or some kind of uh, truth or belief system we have to kind of hold to uh, the way we think. When reality is, it was always much more than that. So particularly if you look at the life of Peter, I know this, loving God does not mean being perfect. 
I mean, like I said, Peter was impulsive. Peter chopped off the Roman soldier's ear in the garden. Peter gave up when Jesus died and went back to fishing. Peter was a slow learner. He was constantly comparing himself to the other disciples. In fact, even in the story, the very next line, it says that Peter asked Jesus, hey, Lord, who will betray you? What about him? <laughs> Peter was a mess. And of course, not long before this story, Peter had betrayed Jesus at his most desperate hour. Not once, not twice, three times. And yet, and yet, God entrusted to Peter the keys to the kingdom. It's unbelievable. And it's not just Peter who shows us that loving God is not about being perfect. Abraham was old. Noah got drunk. David had an affair. Jonah ran away. Gideon was insecure. Moses stuttered. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was depressed. Jacob was a cheater. Martha was a nervous wreck. Paul was a murderer. Thomas was a doubter. But God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I'm not justifying David's affair or Peter's temper. There were consequences to those things. There always are. But don't for one minute ever underestimate how God can use you right now to make a difference in someone's life and in this world. Loving God does not mean being perfect. Nobody's perfect. But we are perfectly loved. One more thing I think loving God isn't from the life of Peter is I think loving God does not mean being educated. And loving God is not about having a theological degree. It's not about knowing how to exposit the scriptures correctly. Peter was an untrained, unlearned fisherman. He, he didn't know the Mosaic law. He didn't know Greek like Paul. He, he didn't even have a Bible. Neither did the early church for the first few hundred years. Loving God does not mean getting everything right. And loving God does not mean having all the right answers. Because it's not about those things. It's about relationship. Peter, do you love me? Tom, when Jess asked me, do you love me? I mean, I can read all the marriage books in the world and still be a terrible husband. I can have all the knowledge. I can clean the house, stack the dishwasher, put the kids to sleep, do all the right things and still be cold and distant from my wife. The question, do you love me? It's, it's, it's more than those things. Do you care about me? Do you trust me? Do you want to be near me? And I believe God is asking us those same questions today. Okay, so now that we know what loving God doesn't look like, let's go back to the story and we're going to unpack what it does look like. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And then Peter says, yes. Uh, Jesus gives him three next steps, you could say. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep and follow me. And so I want to unpack those three answers and how they, I think, can apply to our own lives today. The first one, feed my lambs. When I've read this story before, I've kind of wondered, is there a difference between lamb and sheep? Because the word recorded here for lamb in the Greek is different from the word for sheep. And I think there must be a reason for that. A lamb is essentially a baby sheep, of course. And, but I think as describing people as lambs in this context, I think the writer is emphasizing our nature as immature and vulnerable and in need of tender care, like a, like a baby. And remember, Peter was a fisherman, I mean, not a shepherd, by training. And so he was used to nets and boats and water. And now he's called to feed lambs. These are very different tasks. A fisherman doesn't stay up at night protecting his fish from slaughter. He doesn't lovingly tend the fish knowing that they will die without him. As a matter of fact, the fish should probably fear the fisherman who doesn't really have any, you know, doesn't take the fish's personal welfare to heart. But a shepherd has a completely different calling. In fact, specialists in, in science, the science of animal husbandry, they point out that a lamb, as we know it, is a species that survives only by human intervention. Feed my lamb, says Jesus. And so I think for me, this is about caring for the vulnerable and the weak amongst us. I mean, remember Jesus' sobering remarks referring to judgment day. He says, for I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't even clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. Now depart from me because I do not know you. 
I mean, these are piercing words from the mouth of Jesus. And so it would seem from what Jesus is saying here that to love God, it has something to do with caring for the weak and the vulnerable. And yes, of course, that means the widow, the orphan and the poor. But I think it also means our own children. I think it also means our spouses when they're having a hard time or feeling down. I, I think it means offering grace and mercy and forgiveness to our colleagues to the people around us. I think it means being kind to everyone you meet because everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. It means being gentle and patient. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do, Lord. Well, then feed my lambs. He goes on, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. That's the second instruction. Take care of my sheep. You see, like lambs, sheep cannot survive without a shepherd. Take away the shepherd and the sheep will die. They, they will be lost. They, they starve. They'll be torn apart by predators. But the difference here between lambs and sheep is that in this picture, we are not the shepherd. I mean, this is so important to realize. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as my father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus says the shepherd uh, he, he calls out the sheep and the sheep, they know his voice. They listen to his voice. We also see, if you look into John chapter 10, verse 2, this mention in this picture of a gatekeeper, the one who opens the gate for the shepherd, for, for Jesus to, to speak and to call the sheep out. And so it would seem that the gatekeeper's job is to look out for enemies and then teach the sheep how to listen to the shepherd's voice. And that really hit me this week as I was preparing, you know, because here's the truth. I am not the shepherd. Jesus is. But I am called to point out the shepherd and help others discern and recognize his voice in their lives. And, and this is not just a call for pastors, but for all of us. That, that could be sharing a word of encouragement with someone. It could be a phone call to say, hey, I'm thinking of you in this time. It could be an invitation to church or the courage to pray over and for someone. It may be sharing a word or a picture that God has given you for someone. It may mean walking alongside someone in their pain or in their questions and doubt and, and helping them to see the hand of God in their lives or, or to, to recognize the voice of God. You know, I, I, I can't be my kid's shepherd. <laughs> Only Jesus can be that. Only he can transform their little hearts. Only he can awaken those things buried deep in their soul. Only he can save their souls. But as the gatekeeper, man, I can teach my kids and model for my kids how to listen for and discern the voice of the good shepherd and protect them from enemies as well. You see, we tend to think of shepherding or gatekeeping kind of in this very like pastoral caring idea. And, and that's true. Shepherds do care and tend the flock, but they must also slay predators. You know, as a shepherd boy, King David, he killed bears and lions. David the shepherd was also David the mighty warrior, as Goliath would find out. And so for me, the instruction to take care of my sheep, I think it means helping others to discern the voice of God in their lives and recognize God at work in the world. And I think it means protecting people uh, from the enemy around us who, who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And that enemy takes many forms. It could be unhealthy beliefs that people are holding on to. It could be unhealthy patterns of behavior. It could be religion. It could be selfishness or complacency or greed or depression or fear. There are so many things that can so easily trip us up and hold us back from the life God has for us. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, then take care of my sheep. A third time he asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then as we read earlier, Jesus describes Peter's death. And then he says to him, follow me. That's the third and final instruction, follow me. And this is really the key for me on what it means to love God. You see, Peter was crucified, just like Jesus, except records tell us that he actually opted to be crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Christ. 
And that's what I think Jesus meant when he told Peter on the beach that day, that when you're old, you'll be stretched out and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. So let me be clear. This invitation of Jesus is not some nice, comfortable journey, you know, that, that Jesus is asking Peter on. He's saying, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Well, then will you follow me? Even unto death. It's like Jesus is warning Peter, saying this is not going to be easy. In fact, this is going to be really, really hard and painful. Because to follow me is to pick up your cross. And all of us, every single one of us, has a cross that we must bear. In John chapter 14, Jesus told the disciples very clearly, if you love me, keep my commands. And again in verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. What teaching? To love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love people. And then Jesus says, I will use you then to make a difference in this world far greater than you could possibly imagine, Peter. You see, when Jess asks me, Tom, do you love me? Like I said, what she's really asking, I think, is, do you like me? Do you want to be near me? Do you want to hear what I have to say? Do you value my opinion? Do you believe we're better together? Am I the one for you? Am I first? Is God not asking the same of you today and and of me today? Is he not saying, am I the one? Do you want to be near me? Do you want to hear what I have to say? about your finances, about that issue you're having, about that question that you've been asking? Do you value my opinion? Are you seeking it out or are you searching everywhere else except my word? Do you believe that we're actually better together, that if you surrender to me, I will actually do a better job of it than you could ever do on your own? Do you trust me? Or or am I just another cog in the machine of your busy life? You see, I think ultimately loving God is about surrendering to him. That's what it's really about, surrender. Giving him your first, your best, your ultimate allegiance. To love my wife is to put her first. It's to love my kids is to put them before me. To love God is to put him first. The problem with that is that it means that I have to come second or third or fourth My preferences, my opinions, my rights, I have to lay them down. And I don't like to do that. Surrender is hard, but it's the only way to true life. And that's why Jesus says these words. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. And so as we gather online and however we're gathering this Sunday, I want you to be honest with yourself. Maybe take a moment even now. When Jesus asks you the question, do you love me? Or maybe do you love me more than these? More than your fish, more than your security, more than your comfort, more than your plan? Are you willing to follow? Are you willing to surrender? to lay it down, to give God your best, the best of your time, the best of your talent, and the best of your treasure. And I know this isn't easy, but as I read the scriptures, there's really no way around it. To love God is to surrender to God, to make him the Lord of your life, to give him, the, the, to put him in the driver's seat, and then to find life and life in all its fullness on the other side of that surrender. Let me close by saying this. In my Bible, the title of this story is this, Jesus reinstates Peter. Jesus reinstates Peter. And I love that because that's what I believe God told me to tell you today, that he is about the business of reinstating things. He's reinstating the church. He is reinstating your future. He's reinstating your identity, your purpose. And yes, it will be hard. Life is hard. But you can do and we can do hard things. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Three times Peter had denied Jesus. And three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He's undoing what Peter did. He's canceling the debt. He's saying, it doesn't matter if you messed up. I'm reinstating you, Peter. 
and us with him. He's calling him and he's calling us to something bigger, bigger than fishing, bigger than what we already know, bigger than what's safe for us, bigger than what Peter or we can see or imagine. And then he calls Peter by name, not his nickname, his full name. He's speaking to his core identity, Simon, son of John. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. Thomas, son of Mike, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. Then feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, follow me. Rainan, son of Rollins, Heather, daughter of Donald, do you love me? Yes, Lord, we do. Then are you willing to follow me even unto death? Yes, Lord, we are. Then let's go because there's much work to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this encounter with Peter on the beach, for this encounter with us today. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is alive and at work even now as we watch through a screen or a phone. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to every single person watching this now. Convict us, challenge us, stretch us, grow us, and help us to answer that question. Will, do you love me? Yes, Lord, we do. And help us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this hole. Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. God, that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to see. Thank you, Tom, for sharing that message and a bold invitation to love God. If you are watching this and you felt a, a call to love God, perhaps for the first time, you feel like your heart is stirring up around this invitation. I want to encourage you to connect with us because we want to journey with you on this journey of discovering what that means. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you're watching on graceonline.tv, there's a button you can click right now, or you can email us at online at grace.org.za. 
And hey, if you're feeling brave enough, you're even welcome to comment and let us know that way and our team will connect with you and journey, journey with you. Yeah, the second way you can respond is through liking this message on whichever platform you're on right now. Click the share button if you're on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can keep in the loop. This helps us take the message into your world and so that we can reach more people uh, than we ever thought we could reach. Also, if you're following us on social media, you'll be able to find out all the information about the new service times and when those will go back and all of that. Absolutely, and the third way that you can respond uh, is through your generosity. There was this invitation that Tom shared with us throughout the message, but I really wanna invite you to participate with us uh, in, in giving. And this, this helps us share that message of hope and life, of God's love for the world to the world. So thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you soon.